You got what I need? Yeah. On the streets of New Orleans, All right. drug money bought the city's cops. Good. Officers became the strong arm of drug money, brutalizing anyone who dared speak out. With police tainted by greed, undercover agents would have to put their lives on the line to bring down the corrupt officers who hid behind a shattered shield. In a city of Washington narcotics, the drug lords have all the power, even over the police. Corruption in New Orleans grew like cancer, eating away at public safety and threatening to destroy the city. Lured by easy wealth, crooked cops began breaking the laws they were sworn to uphold. I'm Jim Kallstrom, former head of the FBI's New York office. When it became clear that the police could no longer police themselves, the FBI had to get involved. It was a case where the line between friends and enemies became dangerously blurred. New Orleans, 1993. Tourists packed the city looking for a good time, not all of it legal. Cocaine was in demand and the dealers cashed in. It was a violent business. For protection, the drug lords turned to those whose duty was to serve and protect. The cops. Officers lined their pockets while enforcing the will of the dealers. They controlled turf like thugs, terrorizing innocent civilians. Agent Stan Haddon of the FBI's Public Corruption Unit in New Orleans was aware of the growing problem. Our intelligence told us that there was a great variety of corruption uh, taking place among uh, many different officers on the department. However, uh, this, the one thing that seemed to be the most pervasive was that officers were out there working with drug dealers on the street, were protecting drug dealers on the street, and were stealing money and drugs from drug dealers on the street. One such drug dealer was Terry Adams, known on the streets as Scaboo. He was a small-time operator who was being extorted by Officer Sammy Williams. Well, you got what I need? Come on now, give me what I need. Well, I but this me. time, the protection money Scabu paid Williams wasn't enough. On Christmas Eve, the officer demanded that Scabu pay him $10,000 cash by 6 p.m. If Scabu failed to show, Williams threatened to beat him and guaranteed him 20 years to life. That evening, at 5 p.m., Special Agent Stan Haddon was finishing up some last-minute work. About to go home, he took one last call. It was Scabu. His time was running out. He told Haddon that he was being blackmailed, but didn't have the $10,000 the corrupt cop was demanding in less than an hour. When Skaboo contacted me, we realized that that was our best chance to do something about police corruption. And I immediately arranged to meet him and, and debrief him in person. Uh, there was no way we could get everything together by 6 o'clock. Um, by the time I met with him, it was uh, 30 minutes before the deadline. Yeah, I feel pretty good about that. Um, Haddon and his partner quickly hashed out a plan. This is, I think, the best one we've got. Skaboo would meet the officer as arranged, but he'd be wearing an FBI wire. The agents couldn't arrange $10,000 on such short notice. Scabu would have to convince the cop to accept smaller payments over several meetings. Yeah, I'm pretty sure. Okay, they could be rough. Well, you know that. You work with them. Yeah, I have. Assured by Haddon that he would be under constant surveillance, Scabu took his position.
Officer Sammy Williams was still on duty when he arrived with a prisoner tucked in the back seat of his cruiser. drove Scabu to a deserted spot behind a seafood market. He ordered him to throw the $10,000 into the trunk. Scabu told Williams he only had $3,000 now, but would pay the rest later. If the cop arrested Scabu, he'd never get his pay. Agents hoped Williams would agree to meet him again for more of the money. He did, and the FBI had it all on tape. Hadn't believed this one incident would lay the groundwork for exposing more corruption in the New Orleans Police Department. Our main objective was to try and create a strategy that would enable us to prosecute as many bad officers as we possibly could. In the days that followed, Agents, along with prosecutors from the United States Attorney's Office, began to plan their operation, codenamed Shattered Shield. Assistant U.S. Attorney Al Winters would advise agents every step of the way on what would be needed to convict the dirty cops. We were involved really from day one. We met with the case agents on numerous occasions and discussed exactly what we were interested in being developed as far as evidence in, in the case. As with most corruption cases, the FBI's strongest evidence would likely come from wiretaps. According to Special Agent Karen Jenkins, an FBI wiretap specialist, securing them isn't easy. Title III is a court-authorized intercept or wiretap. It's very difficult to get one approved. It's a lengthy process, very time-consuming. Basically, we have to have approval by FBI officials to get one, and beyond that, we have to have the review and approval by Department of Justice officials. Finally, a federal judge will make the final determination as to whether or not one is authorized. After delivering two more payoffs to Officer Williams, Scabu had won his trust. Now the FBI seized the opportunity to take the operation to the next phase. Scabu would approach Williams with a proposition. The volume of drug business was going to increase, and Scabu would need more cops to protect it. If Williams was interested in higher payoffs, he would need to hire more dirty cops to handle the expansion. Williams took the bait. Scabu met with him for another recorded payoff in mid-January 1994. Don't forget now. But this time, Williams showed up with another officer. He turned out to be Len Davis, Sammy Williams' partner. It wasn't surprising. Davis was known in the projects as a gangster with a badge. Reviewing the tapes hadn't discovered a problem. What are looking for? Both Davis and Williams used the coded language of the drug trade. To make charges stick, the FBI had to record the officers using language that a jury would understand. Hadn't pressed Scabu to get Williams and Davis to use words like dope so there'd be no doubt at trial. But when Scabu told the cops, the dope is in, Davis suspected something was up. If you're, uh, if you're in the police business and somebody starts using words that are that overt and that plain, that immediately makes you suspicious that this uh, person is trying to set you up. Davis shoved Scabu into the car and told Williams to drive. The agents would be too conspicuous on the deserted streets. If they pursued the cops now, they would put Scabu's life at greater risk. 
The only thing they could do was sit patiently and listen to the wire. When the car came to a stop, Davis's rage ignited. He yelled that Scabu was never to say the word dope again. They immediately took him to a, a deserted location, aggressively searched him. Uh, you can hear the Velcro ripping loose on his clothes and stuff. And uh, that was a very tense moment. Davis insisted that he wouldn't go to jail for careless talk. He and Williams stripped Scabu looking for a wire. Scabu was sure he was going to die. Miraculously, they never found him. He's clean, he's clean, he's clean. He's clean. I'm not going to jail behind you. Their trust was restored. You understand me? Scabu continued his protection deal with Davis and Williams. For the next job, the cops drove him to a store where a drop-off was to take place. Inside, Scabu checked a bag at the counter. He passed the ticket to an agent posing as a buyer, who then retrieved the bag. Williams and Davis watched as each transaction went down. They were promised $1,000 for every kilo of cocaine they protected. For them, the deals meant easy money. Davis and Williams met Scabu behind stores and alleyways for the protection payoffs. The FBI recorded every word. Gradually, Operation Shattered Shield was building a solid case against police corruption. The recordings continued into the spring of 1994. Once agents were sure Davis and Williams were solidly on board, the FBI prepared to expand the investigation. With still more cocaine to guard, Williams and Davis would need to recruit more dirty cops. Federal agents hoped to snare every one of them. But agents knew the officers may become suspicious of Scabu's rapidly growing drug business. They needed to bring in a big time dealer, someone whose status as a kingpin would explain the larger shipments. You like some? Okay. Hadn't called on one judge, uh, an FBI agent trained specifically JJ for working here undercover. To represent a drug kingpin from, from up in the East Coast. At that time, I was in New York City, and I had been contacted uh, to come down to just uh, be interviewed and go over the actual case. A lot of times, they'll, they'll be looking for a certain person, height, weight, you know, color, or whatever, um, to infiltrate or get into a certain group. Known as JJ, the agent would act as Scabu's cocaine supplier, proposing to use New Orleans as a hub to store and distribute his product nationwide. I was a high-level drug dealer. Um, I played that role and I had ties where my operation uh, was in both Miami and in New York City. With the arrival of JJ, Shattered Shield was about to grow from a minor drug business to a booming enterprise. Jackson was one of the FBI's best undercover agents. He was smart and experienced. But his life would be in the hands of the informant, Scabu, who had no training. Jackson needed to build complete trust with Scabu, or they'd both be dead. The informant, because he lives that world, is probably the, for me anyway, the most important, because he himself has been there. He's been around these people. If he's not believable, it's not going to work. And I think uh, that was the big thing for me down there, was to make sure that uh, we were going to be believable. Jackson and Skebu rehearsed their roles again and again, preparing for the real test with Davis and Williams. Jackson, federal agent from the north, and Skebu, a southerner who had dealt drugs all his life, had to forge a common history. 
that they no, had you, Their story would be that they had met in the army. After their stint was up, they had kept in touch. Right, okay. They hashed and rehashed details of their friendship, habits, fake memories that they'd have to know cold, and when to say them. They were dealing with criminals who could run thorough background checks and who were free to use deadly force. We knew that whatever we had, we had to keep it simple, but we had to make sure that we remembered certain things. The biggest thing I thought that helped us was my initials, my nickname. So no matter how many times they would ask him, what's his name? He believably said, because he only knew, <laughs> JJ. In April, the FBI was ready to introduce JJ into the operation. He arrived at a hotel carrying what was supposed to be a drug payment of $100,000. For the first time, Williams and Davis caught a glimpse of the big time dealer. Their perceptions would be critical. The first encounter was in the Sheridan Hotel. They were gonna stand at a distance and just observe. It was another test to see if they were willing to do what they were gonna do. Hey, I don't know how it's gonna work. They could arrest me right now and take me off and, you know, I'm down. You know, because it was supposed to be drug money. So uh, it was a test. Scabu told the cops about JJ and his plan to use New Orleans as a transport hub for his cocaine business. Davis and Williams carefully studied JJ's every move. Jackson was creating his character before their eyes. It would become his full-time identity, and it would have to hold up under scrutiny. Everything depended on what the cops thought they had seen, and if they believed the cash exchange was genuine. The plan worked. The cops were convinced that JJ was the real deal. The FBI was now poised to take Operation Shattered Shield to the next level. By the spring of 1994, the FBI's Operation Shattered Shield, targeting New Orleans police officers involved in the city's drug trade, was in place. Posing as a drug kingpin named JJ, undercover special agent Juan Jackson worked with Scabu, the drug dealer turned FBI informant. Scabu rented a hotel room for JJ to meet officers Len Davis and Sammy Williams for the first time. What's up, man? What's up? That was showtime. That was a big deal. On any first meeting with any bad guys, you know, a million things are going through your mind. I mean, are you going to be believable? Is anything going to happen that's going to change their attitude? It's either going to work from here or we're all going to go home. Playing the street-savvy drug dealer, J.J. insisted that everyone strip to establish trust. Sure. For this first meeting, Jackson didn't wear a wire. He didn't need to. The room had been thoroughly wired by the FBI for audio and video recording. Then, in a bold gamble, J.J. invited them to search the room. Because they were cops, Davis and Williams knew how to find a room wire. But J.J. bet his life on the FBI's technicians. The cops never found the wires. J.J. was beginning to build trust with the officers. But officers are trained to sniff out deception. I mean, you got to think that I'm meeting with two police officers. Because of the guns, you also always have to remember the threat. You always have to be conscious of the threat and remember exactly where they are and what they're going to do and where the weapons are. With the cops convinced for the moment, J.J. began to discuss the proposal approved by case agent Stan Haddon. And he played the role of a big-time drug dealer from New York who was using New Orleans as a transshipment point, simply as a storage point, where he could bring dope in, leave it for a while, have it guarded and protected by the officers, and then thereafter have it shipped out to other points unknown. For their role, J.J. promised to pay them $5,000 every day the cops guarded the warehouse. 
real business, you know what I'm saying? Williams and Davis were enthusiastic about the plan, even offering advice. The cops urged J.J. to hire young drivers, give them company uniforms with name tags, and put signs on the sides of the trucks to resemble legitimate companies. For the FBI, the meeting was flawless. The meeting went off without a hitch. Uh, they bought J.J.'s uh, act. Uh, they believed him completely, and they also said the magic word uh, cocaine, which uh, got it clearly established on tape that we were talking about the officers protecting a, a drug uh, operation. From that May meeting, the plan moved quickly. The FBI found a warehouse that met their needs, far from public view and rival drug dealers. J.J. and Scabu met Davis and Williams for a walkthrough. J.J. and Scabu would meet with Lynn Davis and Sammy Williams at the warehouse for what we call the pre-deal meet. There at that meeting, they would discuss when the dope was coming in, how long it was going to stay in, in town, and how much money J.J. was going to pay for the officers to guard the dope. Once inside, Davis told J.J. that he had half a dozen more officers lined up to guard the cocaine shipments. They would work in 10-hour shifts. Uniformed police outside guarding payloads of cocaine inside. Up to a quarter of a million dollars were within each load. At that June meeting came the first big payments from JJ. More than $10,000. Everything is going smooth. But one aspect of the warehouse plan bothered Assistant U.S. Attorney Al Winters. Basically, what we told the agents, unless we had evidence, irrefutable evidence, that these people knew they were guarding cocaine, we couldn't prosecute it. Because the cops stood guard outside the warehouse, they could later claim they didn't know that drugs were inside. Hadn't had to find a way to prove Davis's recruits saw the drug shipments. His team mulled over ways to bring the drugs into plain view. We need them to duplicate themselves. Here, I'll take those. The officers would have to be recorded seeing and discussing the shipment. Shipments were delivered to the warehouse one weekend every month according to schedule. Then, in mid-July, the FBI sent a shipment that the guards didn't expect. With one load already in the warehouse, an FBI agent dressed as a courier brought another shipment. The driver shocked the guard cops by unloading the cocaine in plain sight. This was too overt for Len Davis's crew. They didn't want to see drugs at all. They didn't want the vehicles outside the warehouse unloading drugs and stuff where the officers could actually see it. Quickly, get down here. The cops called Sammy Williams on a cell phone J.J. had given him. Williams called J.J., and J.J. and Scabu raced to the warehouse. Come here, come here, J.J. Come here, responded like a hot-headed drug crazy. dealer. I was arguing with this guy. I mean, we were actually screaming at each other. What, what are you doing? We, you know, you know, where are you? Whatever. And he's observing this. There's a police officer calling Lynn, telling him all of what's going on and how this doesn't look good. To the cops, this whole drug operation was starting to look dangerously unprofessional. Concerned, the driver made another call. Sammy Williams arrived to straighten out the problem. JJ explained it was the driver's screw. He asked that the cops escort the van to the city limits right away. Despite the risk, the episode worked. 
It showed that the cops knew what was inside the warehouse. Right, what's going on? to the edge of town, all right? And it was all video. Just let them go. Just let them go. But the episode raised doubts for the cops. Either JJ was an amateur, or he was part of a sting. Either way, they'd be watching him more closely now. Shattered Shield wore on into the summer as all of New Orleans baked. About 100 degrees out there. In August, guarding the warehouse proved hard duty. The cops complained of the wear and tear on their engines from running the air conditioning all day in the heat. They wanted a vehicle that was more comfortable, that could also endure the long hours, perhaps a van. The officers asked Len Davis to provide one, and Davis brought their request to JJ. For the investigation, it was a huge break. The sweaty cops had just handed the FBI a golden opportunity. It was a stroke of luck. One day, Lynn uh, approached me and said that the officers were complaining that uh, they're running their cars in air condition, and the cars are starting to overheat, you know, they're burning gas, you know, on and on and on. Once we were able to rent the van and, and, and put the listening device inside, we were able to hear a lot more conversations. The FBI quickly filed the paperwork to get court-authorized wiretaps for the van. Technicians carefully installed state-of-the-art microphones. They had to yield top sound quality for months with no maintenance. The van was a perfect Trojan horse for getting inside information. I picked this out myself. The shiny new van made the officers suspicious. They wondered if anyone could have tampered with it. It ain't nothing wrong with it. They wanted to know exactly where Davis had gotten the vehicle. I've never seen this vehicle before. Because JJ had so completely won Davis's trust, Davis told the cops that he himself had rented the van. He vouched for it. That calmed their fears. I picked it out myself. What do you think? Len Davis didn't want anyone upsetting his flow of payments. I picked it the up. FBI would soon learn just how ruthlessly Davis guarded his interests. After three months of shattered shield, more and more New Orleans cops came under the FBI's investigation. Len Davis and undercover agent JJ met often to discuss drug shipments and payoffs for police protection. Davis made frequent threats. They'll tell you, we run this city. We do whatever we want to do. They let me know that very many times. If they feel like they want to shut it down, they'll shut it down. But Davis liked the money. JJ knew that as long as the money flowed, he would never shut the operation down. Davis called the shots for the other officers. He recruited and set the schedules using his cell phone. But he complained about his bill. So JJ offered Davis a new cell phone, free of charge. It was one more way the FBI could record the cops' knowing involvement in drug trafficking. The wires the FBI had planted in the warehouse van were paying off. One night, two guards on the graveyard shift brought prostitutes to the van. The wires picked up everything, even the cops' sexual indiscretions. When Jenkins heard this, she immediately phoned JJ. The situation was a chance to catch the cops off balance. JJ called Davis to complain and to see what they'd get on tape. He told Davis he had checked out the warehouse and found that the cops weren't protecting him. JJ wasn't paying cops to have sex. He ordered Davis to straighten things out. Davis arrived in a fury. His henchmen were threatening to ruin his whole operation. Lynn was upset. Lynn was a businessman through and through. Lynn wanted it to work exactly one way. And he was really upset that I was upset. And uh, he got up, he got up, he came out there and, and just kicked everybody out. You got a problem, man. 
JJ's call brought Davis down on him hard that night. But the episode triggered deep suspicions among the dirty cops. They now felt sure that JJ was the problem and believed they could run the operation better themselves. They discussed ways to kill JJ. Their plans alarmed Agent Karen Jenkins. When I heard those conversations were they were threatening to do harm to our undercover agent, it sent a chill down my spine. It scared me. Um, before I came to New Orleans, I had worked with JJ in another office, so I knew him personally, and I was very concerned. Despite the threats to his life, JJ was resolute, keeping the cops engaged with plans to further expand the operation. He promised Davis that the largest shipment would arrive before Christmas. After that, he would move the deliveries to another part of the city. All the time, JJ had to draw out more evidence on tape without making Davis suspicious. He was very careful. He watched everything. He paid attention to everything I said. There were conversations where we'd talk, and I'd use the word cocaine. He would count the times I used it. And he would tell me, Jay, you said cocaine five times. Jay, you said kilos five times. So I had to be careful. At the same time, Haddon and his team had to defuse another plot they overheard. The cops were threatening to kill the couriers and steal the cocaine. The agents scrambled delivery time and mapped new routes to and from the warehouse to keep the cops off balance. With so many dirty cops, the FBI couldn't make a clean sweep from the outside alone. Agents would need someone powerful in the police force to be a strong ally. Despite the danger of leaks, they decided to seek help from within the New Orleans Police Department. October 1994 brought fresh changes to New Orleans in a new police chief, Richard Pennington. So, how do you like our first Pennington was an outsider from Washington, D.C., hired in the hopes of reforming the Crescent City's crooked police force. The FBI invited the new chief for a meeting. Then Haddon introduced J.J. He informed Pennington that Operation Shattered Shield was uncovering corruption deep in the force that he was about to head. His cooperation would be critical for the success of Operation Shattered Shield. On the streets of New Orleans, Davis and Williams were still on active duty, cruising their territory. Len Davis had a long list of public complaints against him. During their rounds one night that October, Davis and Sammy Williams patrolled the Desire Housing Project. Seeing the pair of cops approach, two youths took flight. Williams chased one teenager down, bludgeoned him, and left him bleeding in the street. At that moment, Kim Groves, the victim's aunt, decided the police had terrorized their neighborhood long enough. That. The next day, Groves, a 32-year-old mother of three, filed a complaint against Lynn Davis and his partner. She cited the pair for police violence. An officer alerted Davis about the complaint. You want to know his name? Officer Davis, do you know him? Assistant U.S. Attorney Mike McMahon saw the report. She reported not only Sammy Williams, who did the actual brutality, but Len Davis as well, who, who had nothing to do with that pistol whipping. And uh, at that point, uh, Len Davis became uh, uh, enraged. For Davis, Grove's complaint came at the worst possible time. It would bring unwanted attention just as the new police chief was coming on board. I know what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna get her. Len Davis vowed to get revenge. The same day that Kim Groves filed her complaint, Richard Pennington was sworn in as New Orleans' new chief of police. 
That marked the start of Shattered Shield's final phase. The shift from an FBI effort to a partnership with a city desperate to clean house. That very night, Agent Jenkins recorded several conversations that would show just how rotten some of the city's men in blue had become. The first call was cryptic. Hours after Pennington was sworn in, Len Davis made a call on his cell phone. He gave an order to an Look, unknown man. I need you to do a 30 for me. Yeah. The FBI taped the conversation, but Grover. because Davis spoke in modified police code, yeah. agents didn't know what it meant. While they attempted to decipher it, agents recorded a second, more disturbing call. This time, the unknown man called Davis. As they spoke, a police dispatcher announced a murder in the Desire Housing Project. The victim's name, Kim Groves. When Davis heard the news, he cried, Rockabye. It was the triumphant cry of a killer. When he later heard it, the call shocked Assistant U.S. Attorney Mike McMahon. As soon as he confirmed the name of Kim Groves, Davis shut off the radio and then on the, um, uh, the wiretap conversation, uh, over the cell phone just exulted in a primal scream of delight that indeed Kim Groves uh, was dead. When agents reviewed the tapes and checked the phone records, they discovered that the man who spoke to Davis was Paul Hardy. Davis had asked Hardy for a 30, a police code normally used to report a homicide. But that night, Davis used it as an order for the murder of Kim Groves. Canvassing the projects, agents quickly learned that Hardy was a known drug dealer who led a small gang of thugs. With the help of two accomplices, Hardy acted quickly, coldly, and for just $300. Sped away over a bridge, Hardy threw the barrel of the gun into the canal and handed the body of the gun to an accomplice for safekeeping. What's up, man? When the FBI realized Davis's role in the murder, agents grew more concerned for JJ's safety. J.J. met with Davis soon afterward. He looked carefully for signs that Davis was anxious or upset. Yeah, what's up, he saw man? none. Yeah. The murder of Kim Grove seemed to have relaxed Davis. J.J. still had to play his part, the role of a drug lord. Though uneasy, he was careful not to talk about the murder. I wanted to ask a lot of questions about it. I couldn't. The only thing I'd ask him was, is there anything different happening since the last time I was here? He said no. And we went on just like nothing ever happened. Is he a cold-blooded killer? I could probably do you in a minute, yeah. Having seen what Davis and his cops could do, J.J. had every reason to believe that he could be next. He was unaware that they were already planning ways to kill him. Days after Len Davis ordered the murder of Kim Groves, the FBI learned of more threats by Davis's men. A New Orleans police officer assisting in Operation Shattered Shield received an anonymous threat. It came with Kim Groves' obituary. The message was clear. Death would come to those who talked. That day, Stan Haddon learned of still more threats against J.J. and the other agents. Agent Jenkins had recorded five cops at the warehouse plotting to kill the couriers and J.J. Then they would steal the cocaine and sell it themselves. Haddon had no choice. The FBI had to wrap up the operation before it was too late. 
Uh, once we realized that uh, the lives of our undercover agents were at serious risk, uh, then we had to react to it. We had to do something. The FBI needed to move up their plans for the big shipment J.J. had promised to Davis. A cocaine shipment so large that it would require a half dozen more cops to guard it. But Haddon needed a location unfamiliar to the cops, a place where the FBI could mobilize quickly. He and his team scouted the Mardi Gras truck stop on Elysian Fields Avenue. The spot had good highway access. It also posed little risk to the public in the event of a shootout. The cocaine would arrive on an 18-wheeler, then be loaded into cars and escorted by the cops out of the city. Every detail had to be mapped out. The plan would require the coordination of 85 agents positioned strategically along the routes. When Davis put out the word about a huge November 18th shipment, he enticed new recruits. As a load of cocaine worth a quarter of a million dollars arrived, Davis, Williams, and their crew stood ready as protection. Agents posing as drivers moved the shipment. From the command center, Haddon and Jenkins kept watch of the whole operation. There were hundreds of ways the truck stop scenario could go wrong. With the undercover agents' lives on the line, there was no margin for error. The cocaine was divided in two loads. Williams escorted one, Davis followed the other. They shepherded the couriers to the edge of town, shielding them from other drug gangs and from the law. To make it easier for our surveillance, we had one of the uh, courier cars go to the east and one go to the west because we had two complete surveillance teams operating simultaneously, and we didn't want the two to get crossed up with each other. The operation went off without a hitch. Six additional cops were videotaped in the act of drug trafficking. The FBI was about to enter the last phase of Shattered Shield, arresting the corrupt cops who would kill anyone who opposed them. After the big truck stop operation, FBI agents moved quickly on the murder of Kim Groves. They searched the house of the hitman, Paul Hardy. There, agents found an unauthorized copy of a guide to police codes, the same codes that Davis used when he ordered Grove's murder. Another search at the home of one of Hardy's accomplices turned up the murder weapon, a nine millimeter handgun. The two investigations, Shattered Shield and the murder, were closing at the same time. For the ringleaders, the FBI took no chances. Agents came to Len Davis's house the next day when he was off duty. Look, I ain't done that. What are you talking about? Look, I'm a police officer, man. The thug with a badge was arrested on federal drug charges and for the murder of Kim Groves. For Davis's partner, Sammy Williams, agents would use a different approach. Haddon wanted to flip Williams to the prosecution side. It worked. And they decided, okay, let's uh, throw another curveball and then let's just bring Juan in. So they brought me into the door and I introduced myself, especially to Juan Jackson, the FBI. You could see the, the color leave his face. His world just came crashing down. Sammy Williams turned government witness. His testimony would later prove crucial for getting convictions. Haddon and his team had no time to lose. Before news of Davis and Williams' arrests could spread, they had to deliver the rest of the gang to justice, dozens of armed men in uniform. The strategy we were to employ was to arrest Lynn Davis on December the 5th. And then uh, on December the 6th, we had all of these officers appear before a federal grand jury. And then on December 7th, 
the grand jury ordered all these officers to come to the FBI office to give handwriting exemplars. Len Davis's recruits arrived at the FBI's office to give handwriting samples for analysis together with 60 fellow officers. Since the drug ring involved no written records and so many officers provided writing samples, the crooked cops suspected nothing. Like the others before it, the FBI's ruse worked. One by one, more than a dozen dirty cops of New Orleans were arrested. That, that was a safe way to do it because obviously all of these officers were armed and they were facing very serious charges and, and that was a way to do it to avoid any potential for uh, any bloodshed or any uh, unwanted uh, um, uh, resistance by the officers. In court, the FBI's recordings build a solid case Davis, against the officers. Are you aware we have hours and the videos hours and audio tapes spoke louder than the code words and erased evidence, all doubts that jurors might have had. Agent Karen Jenkins knew the evidence was strong. The jury was able to hear for themselves what the officers said. They were able to see for themselves what they were doing because of the videos that we had. That wasn't me. It could have been anybody. As Prosecutor Al Winters had predicted early in the investigation, Davis tried to talk his way out of it. All police officers know what that is. It's a homicide. Even after all the safeguards we took, Davis's defense at the trial was that he was conducting his own undercover operation, that uh, it was not really done according to the book, but, you know, he was a, a poor uh, uh, cop and didn't have a lot of training, but he was trying to conduct his own undercover operation. Davis never admitted any wrongdoing. He didn't need to. The audio and videotape spoke for themselves. Faced with the prospect of convicting those sworn to protect them, the citizens of the jury listened intently. The tapes were, were chilling. And as those tapes were played, uh, uh, the courtroom was as silent as, as a cathedral. Has the jury reached the verdict? Yes, Your Honor, we have. Will the defendant please stand? The jury deliberated just 15 minutes. We, the jury, find the defendant guilty of murder in the first degree and hereby sentence the defendant... Len Davis was sentenced to death for his role in Kim Grove's murder, which was later commuted to life. In two other trials, Davis and his co-conspirators received 18 convictions for drug trafficking. Fifteen officers were headed for prison. Because he cooperated with prosecutors, Sammy Williams was sentenced to just five years. He would never again wear a badge. You have irrevocably stained that uniform you once wore. But I must reluctantly recognize that other crimes can only be solved with cooperation of people like you. Court dismissed. For the Big Easy, Haddon's case brought a long, hard look in the mirror. You know, I think that the city of New Orleans has been very tolerant of all sorts of, of uh, conduct. Uh, which might be considered improper in other parts of the country. It's part of the culture here, and I'm a Louisiana native. Uh, but I think this was a wake-up call to the citizens of New Orleans that there was a serious problem within the NOPD, and that problem had to be addressed. You know, you take an oath, and I think that when you do that, uh, there's no excuse uh, for anything else. I think we helped. I, I think that uh, now their focus is different. I think hiring, I think pay scale, I think everything about what the New Orleans Police Department is about is different. Under Chief Pennington, the New Orleans Police Department revamped its practices and fired more rogue cops. The Big Easy had cleaned house. The department and the FBI continue to work together to bring justice to the city's streets. <laughs>